everybody from sunny South Africa. My name is Francois Creel. I have the wonderful privilege to be your host and facilitator for this afternoon's conversation with Hilary Thomas. It is a wonderful um, journey that lies ahead for you this afternoon, and I'm sure you'll all be so inspired by our conversation together. Uh, very briefly, uh, for those of you uh, who would benefit from this quick purpose, I think a lot of you would uh, have been familiar with the sessions up to now and what it is that we're trying to achieve. For those of you who are not familiar with me, my name is Francois Krill. I am passionate about change management and that is my consulting focus. I've started my practice roughly six years ago, operating out of South Africa uh, with global clients, uh, focusing in Southern Africa with any sort of change that they'd like to implement in their business. Uh, these days, data privacy, related changes keeps us quite busy. I also teach part-time at a well-known university uh, on digital transformation specifically. And uh, I'm also involved in various other uh, initiatives and nonprofits uh, down here in South Africa. I think we should spend a little bit more time on Hillary's profile now that you know who I am. And I'll just read through the uh, description here, if you haven't seen it in the LinkedIn uh, posts or the invitation. Hilary Thomas is a partner in PA Consulting, a consultancy bringing ingenuity to life, serving in its healthcare and life sciences practice. She applies her extensive medical experience to support PA clients at all stages of the life sciences value chain. Her expertise also helps to shape thinking across a number of areas of digital health, decentralized health, and product innovation. She is a senior, credible clinician with particular expertise in oncology and medical management. Having been an acute trust medical director and professor of oncology at the University of Surrey, Hilary Thomas is motivated by having a positive impact for patients and in her consulting career, her team's approach to transforming quality of care has benefited patients in over 30 countries across infectious diseases, immunology, oncology, and several rare diseases. She was an elected member of the UK Medical Regulator, the General Medical Council for nine years. Previously, she was Chief Medical Advisor at KPMG for over a decade, and has worked globally across many therapeutic areas to better understand patient experience and how it might be improved, enhancing outcomes and access to innovative medicines. And with that, I'd like to welcome you, Hilary, and thank you so much for spending your afternoon and your time with us. Uh, I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think uh, something that I've learned from you and also from one of my close mentors who has healthcare experience in managing any sort of change in the healthcare environment is extremely risky and comes with a unique set of uh, challenges. I think as a medical professional uh, from our previous conversation, you mentioned to me that you could enforce and affect that change quite quite well and quite effectively where you have to deal with other, other medical professionals, other clinicians. Um, perhaps we can explore that a little bit and then also go to the question in how consultants with uh, no medical background can contribute to the healthcare space. Yeah, so the honest truth is the vast majority of consultants do not have a medical background. In fact, you know, within PA, we've just started to build a little clinical network. There are 13 of us, but 13 out of about 400. So I think there are huge ways that lots of people can contribute. Management is actually really important in healthcare systems. Good management is very important. And many ways, the skills that management consultants bring are those of good managers, good healthcare managers. Uh, so I, I don't think anyone should be phased by not having a medical background. I think the other thing is that the, for the vast majority of situations, whether it's in a particular clinical uh, therapeutic area, you know, a complete particular disease type, or whether it's improving the efficiency of the way our hospitals run their operating theatres or their radiology scheduling or, or um, even how they improve their culture, uh, there are lots of skills that management consultants bring 
to, to, to aid that and to sort of expedite and, and um, make more efficient the way that happens. Uh, so I, I work with quite a lot of people who've spent periods of time in, in healthcare, both as managers, in fact, mainly as managers, sometimes as clinicians. And many of the clinicians I work with chose quite early on in their clinical career to move into more operational managerial type roles. Um, so I work with people who've been physician assistants, who've been pharmacists, who've chosen that they could have more impact, more influence, and would find the work more stimulating to move into a management role. And then from a management role, they've worked with management consultants and thought about coming into consultancy. But equally, I've worked with some brilliant management consultants who left university and joined a graduate program in a big four or in, a, in another consultancy and have you know, worked with healthcare systems throughout that time as well. I think having a medical background gives you a slightly different angle, um, but it also carries with it the risk that you get pigeonholed. So I sometimes find myself labeled as a subject matter expert, and I have to kind of squeeze my way out of that and say, well, you may see me as a subject matter expert, but actually I ran this big complex engagement over here, and my clinical background gave me more credibility, um, but it, it, it didn't stop me from being able to do the things that other management consultants would do. I think that is hugely insightful because many of us may believe that you absolutely need to have healthcare experience to enter the space and uh, to be able to make meaningful contribution. Um, perhaps in managing these high risk environments and, and also medical professionals themselves. I know uh, from, from the consultant who mentored me, affecting change across a hospital group in Canada, um, the doctor's response will be, um, I'm not here to click on this new button. I'm here to save lives. <laughs> uh, or I'm here, I'm here to do my job, you know. What can you share with us, especially those with a non-medical background, um, how to potentially uh, navigate such a, uh, such a high-risk environment? Yeah, I, I think it, the, the phrase we sometimes use is sort of shroud waving. Um, the honest truth is that the contribution that people are making in healthcare systems often saves lives. It doesn't matter whether you're wielding a scalpel or whether you're you know, improving the way processes work so that more patients get seen more quickly. Uh, we know that in the pandemic, we are seeing excess deaths in people who do not have COVID because they're not getting their outpatient appointments quickly enough or they're getting lost on waiting lists or they're dying at home with chest pain because they felt too frightened to come to hospital for fear of contracting COVID. So, you know, it isn't just about um, uh, how you what you do in your day job. And I think that, um, you know, oh, I'm too busy saving lives mentality is misguided. And I think it's it's perhaps easier as with someone with a medical back background to hold the mirror up to that. But I think, you know, you can you can talk about the improved outcomes, the improved access, the improved we, in the UK at the moment, we've got a massive focus on population health management, which is really exciting. But for the first time, we're starting to say, what can we do about life expectancy? rather than what can we do about the backlog or what can we do about the waiting list or what can we do about you know, the patient experience, we actually want to deliver something really tangible, which is improves people's life expectancy. Because over the last 10 years, if anything, it has stalled and started to go backwards for many more deprived populations. And I think with the pandemic, that's quite likely to be a, um, a, a national, an international picture, not just a UK picture. And uh, tying into that, we have spoken about this concept of strengths-based leadership that you're quite a, an advocate uh, of in uh, your approach to consulting. And I, I was wondering what young consultants in particular can gain from this approach. It seems like what we're learning from you is the ability to paint this clear picture, this bigger picture, this compelling view of the future. Uh, can link and tie in with that. Uh, so I thought that could be a, a nice uh, topic that links to what we were discussing. So, so um, I work with a colleague called Sally Bibb, who's published quite widely on this. She's published several books um, uh, on strengths-based leadership. She ran her own consultancy for a while. She originally started off at The, um, the Economist, 
and she ran her own consultancy and has worked with a lot of healthcare organizations and others. So she worked with the NHS on how to identify the right characteristics of people who would be good leaders in healthcare systems, particularly in nursing. And this was after the mid staffs crisis, where you may remember there was a huge excess of deaths. There were real cultural problems. We've just had another inquiry in relation to maternity services in the UK in the Royal Shrewsbury Hospital that's just come out with over 200 excess deaths from um, mothers being pushed towards natural births when cesarean sections would have been more appropriate. Uh, and Sally has worked on this whole strengths-based concept for, for some years, and it's really piqued my interest into how we enable people to have more successful careers in consulting, but also in other fields of life. And what organizations have done historically, I think, is have had a, a slightly um, a tunnel vision view of what it takes to be a good management consultant or a, 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 a good um, accountant, a good whatever. And if you don't fit that template, then you're kind of, you're the square peg. Then we try to push you into the round hole. We try to change you to fit what we think is, is good. And in fact, our head of people came from a very well-known strategy consultancy and said that much of her junior career was feeling that she had to develop the competencies that that consultancy held very highly, whether that suited her strengths or not. And so what PA has been doing now has been thinking about strengths-based approaches so that people play to their strengths. They don't play to their weaknesses. They don't take their weaknesses and work on them because however much you try to do that, it's much harder to take your weaknesses and make yourself stronger in that place than to appreciate what your weaknesses are, appreciate what your strengths are and play to your strengths. So our approach is based on the idea that you should spend 80% of your time doing things that relate to your strengths. So for me, I would say networking is one of the things I really enjoy, uh, you know, dealing with clients. I enjoy, I'm doing much more delivery in my current role than I was a couple of years ago, which I enjoy and, and is one of my strengths, uh, you know, I, I think if we all recognize what our strengths are and we then build teams so that those teams cover the base of a whole range of strengths. So if you take things like Bel Belbin um, or Myers-Briggs and you just think about the range of personalities that you might have looking at those characteristics, the best teams will have a diversity of those skills. They'll have the completer finisher, they'll have the shaper, they'll have the plant, the resource investigator, or the ENFPs and the ISTJs, so that you're actually covering all of those eventualities, but you're also enabling people to bring their whole selves to work and to play to those, those strengths, really. So I, I do think a strengths-based approach not only enables people to bring their best and perform at their best and perform in a way, if you like, we, the other way to describe it is performing according to your spike, um, but it also means that in diversity terms, you enable everybody to thrive. And it isn't just articulate extroverts who always do well. You actually find a way for introverts to feel comfortable and to play to their strengths and contribute, you know, according to their own strengths, rather than a version of the world that everybody thinks we should subscribe to. As an introvert, I found it delightful to learn that. Uh, our preparation. <laughs> I thought it's uh, it's interesting. Uh, it's also touching on a, a topic that we've identified to explore this afternoon. This whole process and approach of inclusive leadership collaboration, and I thought we can go down that path. So it's what's interesting to learn, and in particular for our colleagues here today who are um, in, earlier in their careers. Sometimes we get really stuck on our weaknesses or challenge areas. And I think you have helped frame uh, an inclusive uh, team approach to how we see challenge, challenges and weaknesses uh, and performing better together as a team and uh, leveraging each other's strengths. Uh, we, we have in our previous, or one of our previous sessions, also highlighted how interesting it is that we are collaborating more and more with clients. 
and the clients expect more and more collaboration. Um, the strengths-based leadership approach really does just slot in so well to that too. So do you, do you align with the fact that if you approach that from a team, you'll just serve the client better, you'll collaborate better with the client? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that's that's absolutely right. And and, and you the best relationships with clients are when you're very, very clear about the different roles that you play and whose different responsibilities there are. So I, I think, um, and I also think the whole culture and people thing is often under underrated um, and not seen as important as it actually is. So, you know, for me personally, talking about how you get people in the right headspace, you how you get people, you know, the way you go about making change is to get people to really own it, to pick, to, to, to understand what's required and then to enable it to stick. And you won't get change to stick without actually, you know, that, that, that cultural understanding. So I think having conversations around strengths and what are the strengths of different team players, team, different members of the team, uh, what are the strengths of different organizations is, is really important. And I think it's one of the ways we add value as management consultants is to create pace, to create change, to be more disruptive, perhaps to challenge more than somebody who's going to spend the rest the next 10 years in an organization might be prepared to, so that you can start to catalyze some of that change more effectively. Um, but I think I think you know that that authenticity and candor with clients is really important. Um, it, you know, in, in order to kind of be successful, really, in those relationships. I think there's something that has just come to mind that also perhaps nicely overlaps with the healthcare space that clients hire us not to tell them what they want to hear, but what they need to hear. And how you deliver that and, and communicate that to clients, I think, is a, an important balance. I think sometimes, Hillary consultant to earlier in their career uh, sometimes mis misinterpret that as perhaps conflict or delivery of poorest service standards, things like that. So the ability to separate, um, I think, is a challenge perhaps for, for some of us. Uh, how did you come to navigating those conversations uh, with, with good balance? Yeah. I think some of it comes with experience and I think it, you know, having good and bad experiences is important. My personal view is you often uh, learn more from your negative experiences because they kind of go home better. Um, but I think, I think some of that is about the frequency of checking in. So I have a client at the moment where we've got an engagement that's going extremely well. And I think one of the reasons for that is we check in with that client three or four times a week. So if anything were going off kilter, then we would know about it. And then in addition to that, I check in with him on a one-to-one -one basis, probably every three or four weeks, so that I get the overall feedback about, you know, how are things going? And, 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 and you know, I, th I think it's building that, um, you know, building that, that to and fro, that conversation, that, that ability to keep checking, keep testing, keep making sure. And also the best clients will then say, and can I have some feedback? Are there things I'm not doing? Are there things it would be better if, if I did? You know, even, even down to things like managing expectations. You know, we, we're working on a big complex national program at the moment, which has been fraught with all sorts of issues. But some of that has been because the client has been relatively junior um, and not busy enough, frankly. So they find things for us to do. So we've had to find a way of managing that by saying, can we get that feedback twice a week, not on a continual running basis? If you give us that, those tasks twice a week, then we're not constantly feeding the beast in terms of feeding them, as it were, um, you know, feeding back to them. But we're managing that alongside a major program of work where we really need to focus on the delivery of that work. But I think a lot of this comes with experience and also working with people that you know you're going to learn from, really. So identifying who it is that you admire in your organization, who you think works well with clients, and then learning from their style what will work for you. 
the, the frequency of checking in was uh, a highlight uh, thus far for me. And we tend to undervalue that or make assumptions. So to keep the gap between each party's perception of the service and that gap as close as possible. And something that I learned from you is the frequency of check-ins. Um, however quick or, or, or long, um, are quite valuable. And I think that's something that we can take as a, as a key learning there. Uh, I, think, also, I think in hindsight as well, engagements I can think of that have gone badly have often been because the client didn't have the time to check in. So you were left to some extent having to make assumptions and you weren't given enough time on the agenda or you weren't given enough time in their diary or you weren't given enough time to discuss things with them. And so actually by the time, you know, three weeks had elapsed, you hadn't managed their expectations and you had a different perception of what you should be doing from what had happened with them. And I think so. So I do think that frequent checking in and, and, and testing and having weekly reports and weekly updates is really important for success. A word that is doing quite well at the moment is alignment or alignment session. Uh, that's something I've also picked up that speaks quite nicely to, to what you're saying. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a very neutral, uh, neutral word. Um, I, I think what's interesting that we also learned from our conversations today is the, how innovations in, and healthcare trends in this industry is motivating change in the consulting market uh, in the way we work with, with our clients. We're discussing th that at the moment, so I thought it's good to bring that up. Uh, what can you share with, with our audience on how that is unfolding? Um, can you elaborate a bit more? I'm not quite sure I, I, I know what you're driving at. No problem. So we were speaking about uh, innovations and healthcare industry trends that are motivating changes in the way consultants work or the way uh, yeah. we engage with the sector. So, uh, so I, I think the pandemic true. has brought about huge change, actually, not least our ability to work virtually. Um, so I was having this conversation with someone in Australia this morning. Uh, you, you know, the world has shrunk. We don't feel the need to get on a transatlantic flight or a, an international flight. To have conversations that now we can actually have quite successfully remotely and in fact many clients are now assuming that the delivery will be remote and that there won't be any travel costs in the engagement i think the pandemic has accelerated that and i think it'll be better for the environment and probably better for our quality of life um, that, that we don't go back too much on that um, perhaps a bit more face-to-face -face in the way of meetings i'm going for dinner with my client this evening which was unheard of two years ago um, but actually, you know, one dinner in a two to three month engagement is great. But personally, I mean, I happen to be recovering from um, COVID uh, this week, having picked it up on my way to, on, I think on my way on holiday last week. Um, so, you know, it, 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 it's, it's much easier for people to be working from home. I think many of us prefer to be working from home um, more of the time. We've got used to it. And I think we've got better at having honest conversations over Teams and Zoom and, and other platforms uh, because we've just done more of it. So that's a, I think that's one transformation. Uh, I think another transformation is we've also, the whole ecosystem in which we operate has become much more fluid, but also complex. So we're seeing more partnerships, we're seeing more alliances, uh, we're seeing organizations. So the large national piece of work we're doing at the moment, we have a consortium of 10 organizations. We've got small and large. One of our partners is IBM. Other partners are quite small national organizations in the UK with small numbers of employees, but those employees have real specific subject matter expertise and they add real value. And what our client has said to us is that because of the complexity of our consortium and because of the small nature, some of them are charities, many of them are social care organizations, they feel that this is a much more even partnership between the NHS and our consortium than it would be if it was just one homogeneous big four or strategy house. Now, that's not to sing PA's praises because I know for that particular proposal, several of our competitors also brought together uh, consortia, 
but I think our consortium has been perhaps one of the broadest and I think it's one of the reasons we won the work so I think we're also changing in the kind of complexity of the um the way we partner and the different organizations we go to market with um and that's also a reflection I think of the world of startups the world of digital uh that brings with it all sorts of other aspects of innovation uh we you know we're even used to working now with Miro boards with with surveys you know we get real-time feedback at the end of sessions we certainly always put up a pulse survey now at the end of the sessions we're running on the population health management program so we're getting honest feedback going on and if if we suddenly get a five as opposed to a nine for feedback we know we can go back and try to correct that i don't think we used those skills three or four years ago before the pandemic what's amazing that we've seen over the past few years a significant collaboration across the healthcare space to tackle a global problem. And it's amazing to learn how that has uh, spilled over into the consulting space where we're collaborating more, uh, as you said, and uh, there's more openness to collaboration. Uh, that, that is a wonderful trend that we're seeing. Likewise, we will not be flying or driving around anymore for a 45 minute meeting like in the past. Yeah. Uh, so it's a far more sustainable outlook for both the consultants and uh, the environment. So we, we're definitely looking at quite a number of silver linings uh, that are coming out of the past few years and uh, seeing a, a more sustainable approach to uh, what we do. Uh, with that in mind, before I ask my next question, I just wanted to share uh, with the audience, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please feel free to start posting those questions uh, for Hillary in the chat. I'd love to um, take us to the Q&A in a moment. Uh, the, the last uh, question is on my mind. So what do you believe are the most valuable engagements or uh, conversations to focus on in person? in this new post-COVID world, what, what has been the most valuable topics or, or focus areas for those in-person moments with time? So I think in person, it's all about building rapport, uh, you know, rapport with the clients so that they trust you, so that you become a trusted advisor that they'll work with, you know, over a long period of time, not just on the immediate engagement. And so some of that is actually about spending some time getting to know them, them personally, what's important to them, you know, have they got a family? What, what are their interests? What is it they want to achieve in their current role? Uh, you know, all, all of those aspects. I'm working with a client at the moment who, ironically, we have been Facebook friends for some years. Now, we don't know each other that well, but, you know, in those days of kicking on Facebook. And so the irony for me when I came back from holiday on Monday was that he'd actually seen the the, the video I'd posted of Humpback Whales um, off the Dominican Republic, and my team hadn't. And that was quite a nice example to me of, of actually how I'd been able to build rapport and why, you know, this, this person can be really honest with me. If we, we, we had a second opportunity to work with them and we didn't win that, and he's been able to be completely frank with me as to why we didn't and why our competitors did. So I think it's having that, the, the thing that you can do in person more easily than just um, or, or virtually is build that rapport and have those more difficult conversations, perhaps uh, more challenging conversations. And all those opportunities to build trust, which yeah. are difficult sometimes on virtual engagement. Uh, yeah. I've seen two, two questions come through in the chat. I'll start with the first one. On the issue of prior and relevant experience, I have seen client organizations reject proposals on account of the consultant not having very specific experience in one area, such as medicine but a vastly wider range of experience with others, which may be of value to the engagement. Uh, what are your thoughts on this and what can be done to overcome these limitations? I, I suppose it speaks to that whole generalist versus specialist, specialist uh, conundrum that we often face as consultants. Uh, so I, I think it's a, a really good question. Um, and, and you almost see the opposite sometimes as well, where they don't necessarily value your experience because they have it themselves. So, you know, if you're talking in the life sciences industry to the team involved in lung cancer, you don't need to bring your understanding of lung cancer to them because actually they probably got far better knowledge and awareness because they're steeped in it all of the time. Um, 
On the other hand, if they don't have that experience, if they're coming at it from a different angle of an organization or, or they want to understand the market in something which they're testing, but it's not their own knowledge, then they may want that from you. I think the, the way of demonstrating the value that you bring, which is much wider than that, is actually the perspective from different sectors. So I, th I think the best clients have got an open mind and will say, yes, I'd like to know what we can learn from the airline industry. I mean, if you just look at clinical governance and quality in healthcare, there is so much that the airline industry can teach uh, healthcare because it has had procedures, it's had um, huge consistency, it's, it, it, it's, it's taken approaches that are absolutely about safety so that everything is very repetitive very much about regular and frequent training and your your movement your risk of error is much smaller because actually if you go wrong in the airline industry you lose an entire plane not one individual uh, and and you know you could argue some of the the bad governance stories you do end up losing hundreds of people but it happens over a period of time so that on any individual case, you don't notice that. So I think bringing perspectives from other industries and other areas and demonstrating why you think that will be of benefit in this industry is one way of getting around that, I think, because I don't think people necessarily appreciate that. And so if you can articulate that, um, you know, and there are other examples in, in the pharmaceutical industry, I think there are huge ways in which uh, the consumer market area can bring value and 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 and, and can uh, can really help uh understand their market and understand more about that and i think you really just resonating with the whole purpose of the consultants and yeah the, the different perspectives that we bring into the room and to the problem uh, i think that's a wonderful insight from that question that we received uh, the next question focuses a bit on corporate culture. And can you expand more about how you see corporate culture evolving past the pandemic? Uh, so I think one of one of the ways in which it's evolved is a greater, and I think this is a, a, a broader issue as well, not just corporate culture, is a much greater awareness of mental health, um, which is a really positive thing. I think a way of seeing health much more holistically, not just as physical health with, you know, historically through my career, mental health has been a bit of a Cinderella. It's, it's never had the same status as physical health. I think people now not only see the impact of people being isolated at home, people being fearful of the, the virus, uh, people losing members of their families. I mean, more of us have had close family members or friends who've died during the pandemic. And that I think has had quite a, an emotional impact. So I think there has been much more awareness of the um, of our mental health as an issue. Uh, and I think as a result of that, we're seeing organizations taking a much greater interest in well-being and well-being of their staff. And certainly we as an organization have worked with a couple of very large corporates uh, to bring a kind of future of well-being perspective, which is very data-based, so driven by the data in the organizations, but also very much about engaging staff and staff feeling that actually the organization they work for cares about them. Uh, so I do think that's been quite a, um, a, 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 a um, an important development. I think the other thing is that because we're all on Teams calls, we've democratized, we've democratized access. We've narrowed down the hierarchies. I've heard stories that, you know, even in a big pharma company where because someone has been on a Teams call with 300 people with the CEO, they now feel able to email the CEO. They now feel able to, to, to message the CEO. Much, much better engagement from the top of the shop down through the organization than has been there historically, because people have had to meet in these very large meetings. And it hasn't been dependent on whether you could get to Philadelphia or whether you could get into the office. It's been your ability to just dial in. And I think that's a really positive thing. So I think we've got flatter structures We've got less hierarchy. My CEO wrote a, he writes a, a, a weekly message to all of the people every week. And last week he wrote one about the most important thing that people bring is their ideas. It's not about their status. It's not about their badge. It's not about where they sit in the organization. It's the ideas that they bring. And that's the value that they bring. And, uh, you know, that was quite a democratizing thing for him to say, I think. 
Those are two amazing perspectives on how corporate culture is being changed for the better uh, after our experiences of the last two and a half years. Um, that, that is a great perspective, especially on mental health and wellness. Thank you, Georgiana, for the question. Uh, why is a patient-centric approach important? Hi, Sprecher. I guess it's it's whatever. Um, uh, thank you, Michael. <laughs> um, we don't have a, an Australian office any longer, sadly. <laughs> um, so I think it. I guess it's the same reason that a client-centric approach is important. You have to think what is what is the service. What are you, who are you aiming your service at? And I don't think healthcare systems are always very good at it, actually. I think very often healthcare systems are built around the people working in the system, not the patient. And one of the things that's happened with the pandemic is we've, we've to use that word again, democratised things. You know, people have got access to apps. They've got, you know, in the UK, 22 million people now have the NHS app on their phones. Uh, we've got much better, um, you know, at, at, at uh, working with, um, patients to understand what their issues are, whether it's user experience, whether it's the human factors side of things, you know, if you're going to change a test, you know, the fact that people can test themselves at home now, in fact, we've got a, an opportunity with the NHS at the moment on at-home diagnostics, we're in a position to completely transform the way we deliver care. And because of the shortages of the workforce and the challenges that um, the aging population around most of the world is, is creating, actually, we really do need to transform many pathways of care so that we've got the capacity with patients managing themselves more effectively and being more uh, autonomous and, and independent in that process and not being the victims of a kind of paternalistic um, system that, that, that sort of labels them as a patient rather than a person with a condition. So I think patient centricity is absolutely fundamental and, and will be really essential to enabling healthcare systems to cope going forward. Because if we look at what's happened with the pandemic, certainly ours in the UK, but many healthcare systems have been really quite overwhelmed by all of this. I may, I want to say thank you to Francois for, for moderating, but Hilary, thank you for your presence. Thank you for the information and, and thank you for the smile, even though at times you were talking about personal uh, issues that maybe uh, wouldn't be as, as cheerful as your smile, but you're a strong lady and, and you showed us what it's all about to be able to evolve, to be able to service better and to be able to understand what ourselves are telling us where we should be and what it is that we should do. Thank you very much. It's greatly appreciated. And thank you for the time and the knowledge. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you.